President Craig Blair. Mr. Blair, good morning to you. Good morning. Wonderful to have you here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Live in studio. <laughs> yeah, it's, absolutely. It's a, a rare treat. A rare treat indeed. So uh, we finished our interim session, which was combined kind of with a special session, and we came up with a few different things, not the least of which was an additional 2% on the state income tax cut, which takes it down to an additional 6% on top of the 21.25 you folks had passed previously. That's correct. And uh, th th that was the sweet spot during the additional 2%. Uh, the governor's office uh, identified a bond, and when they said that, that was getting ready to be paid off, and uh, that freed up nineteen, nineteen and a half million dollars, if I remember correctly. And each percent is about twenty-two million dollars that it costs to do that. So that to basically covered one percent. And then the governor's office said, that, you know, they're the ones that's still budgeting for the upcoming year, and that'll be submitted of to the new governor. Uh, but they're going in and making cuts in the government to be able to handle that additional 1%. And we're comfortable with being able to do that. And it fits right tongue and groove in what uh, Patrick Morrissey, and I'm going to speak as if he's going to be the next governor. I predict that that's going to happen. Anybody wants to make a bet otherwise, I'm all in. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll t we'll it's likely. T yeah, it's very likely. And so th that got us that additional 2%. And so... You got 21.25 percent four and another six so that's a significant reduction in the personal income tax for the uh, people of west virginia and craig that will kick in in 18 months is that as i understand it what eric householder told us in his last visit of uh, yes so it, it and we actually uh moved the the, the trigger point out of and the reason for it was is not not that we were wanting to hold on to the money it was the fact that when we're going through the budget processes in january january february and march then the trigger mechanism you did not know what that trigger amount would be we just got done dealing with that this year it wasn't it was all the way from zero to five nobody knew for sure what it was and that makes it hard to be able to manage your budget. So by moving that trigger out, it made it so that future legislatures now will be able to have the accurate numbers in front of them and be able to manage the budget properly. It's all part of that flatline budget. This special session, in fact, is part of the flatline budget. We manage our base build spends in regular session and to, uh, to a greater degree, and then when you get out, it used to be called the back of the budget where you put these things in there. But these are spends that you want to invest in yourself, capital improvements, deferred maintenances, things like that. And and so that's what we were managing. We were hoping to do it sooner, but we didn't get things done in August. So. Highlight some of the other bills that were passed during this session. All right. I'd love to tell to my favorite one, and this is one that I was working behind the scenes on a lot, it was Senate Bill 2035. And what that did was is that we put together – the federal government's got a program out there. It's called BEAD, and it allows $1.2 billion for the state of West Virginia to get fiber on the poles everywhere in the state of West Virginia. If you've got electricity to your home, you will be eligible in the next five years. No, you will have in the next five years fiber on the pole. So high-speed Internet is coming to the high state. High-speed over the entire state. Now, the state had to put up some money for that. and uh, Well, somebody had to, and it was 25%. So what we did was we put $150 million up. $25 million of it is in grants. The other 125 is in loan insurance and loan guarantees for the businesses, whether they're small or large. <clears throat> On that, uh, there are 60 regions to be bid out. Some of them only have one bidder, some of them have two or three. And so that'll all come together here. And But we've we're going to be the only state that qualifies for it. I was with the lieutenant governor from Louisiana. They were the first state to qualify for these funds. He told me, he goes, it's all falling apart, Craig. We're not going to end up being able to qualify for this. And it's hard if you let the businesses just manage it on their own. 
Uh, it's very difficult for them to be able to provide the capital to be able to get this done also. So we did. We will be the first state. It may very well be the only state that qualifies for this buckets of money to be able to do. What makes us unique done. by being the only state to qualify, Greg? What? Because first of all, the threshold of qualifying is very, very difficult. And then, you know, states don't want to give money to private businesses. And we didn't, uh, to a greater degree, that $25 million, uh, that we're going to give, we'll end up getting the interest off of the, the loan guarantee money and the loan insurance uh, because that money will still be sitting in our coffers. But we're guaranteeing that these companies that actually go in, it's the smaller ones that need this loan guarantee. Frontier, Comcast, Sudden Link, they're a large enough company that they won't even utilize this program. But the smaller ones like uh, CityNet is a, a, an example. There's six of them in the state of West Virginia. This makes it so that they'll be eligible to go in. They've already done preliminary bids, but this makes it so that they can go in and put qualifying bids in place. It's a big, big deal. So I, I'm more than elated that we got across the finish line on that. Let me play a little bit of devil's advocate, uh, Craig. Sure. Uh, we've, uh, uh, there is un, unquestionable that we need this, and it's going to be an economic boom to the, to the state. And I applaud you and others for, for doing this. But we've had instances in the past, uh, within the last seven, eight years, that a, uh, a contractor or a supplier would come in and promise uh, promised services, and they were unable to deliver. Uh, Frontier was an example in the southern part of the state uh, five or six years ago. What makes this different this time that will not have the default that we had last time? Great question, and I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, the, first of all, nobody gets paid until the work's done. You can't. They've got to put their own resources up to be able to do that, and then there's no payment that goes out at all until the work is completed. So that is an essential ingredient in being able to make this so that it does come to fruition. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. What's, uh, what's next on your list? Yeah, next one is, is that is near and dear to my heart it also is of uh, HP 208. And this had to do with uh, re relating to making West Virginia an agreement state with the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Basically what this did is it gave West Virginia primacy of like, I believe 38 states already have when it comes to dealing with the nuclear tour or nuclear NRC. I'll mm -hmm. get that. Nuclear I, Regulatory I, Commission. Right. And uh, I'm so used to saying NRC that it's mm -hmm. hard to get the other part of it out. That's why I'm here. And thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I need a translator. Yeah. Yeah. I work with Bill. I'm good. Yeah, he's, used, he's used to that. He translates me all the time. I had some. Fr I'm going to divert for a minute. I had two friends come down the other day, and uh, they hadn't been to the Capitol. And we were sitting the governor's office in this uh, house, and myself. And I asked us, my colleagues. I said, "You mind if they sit in? They will not talk about anything that takes place." Like that. So they sat in on the conversations because we were preparing all forty two or 43 of these bills and getting them ready. And when they were done, I said, what'd you think? And they go, we've never heard so many acronyms in our life. <laughs> I said, we had no idea what you were talking about because everybody used sure. acronyms. Yeah. Government's big on acronyms. And I used to joke about it that I needed a, a translator just to deal with the DHHR mm -hmm. uh, because they'll lose you in a heartbeat on acronyms. But going back to the NRC, that this piece of legislation makes it so that West Virginia has a greater say on what's going on and we manage it without the federal government coming in and doing 100 percent of the management of it and you think about this as is big nuclear reactors no that's not it it has everything to do with the for instance if you get an x-ray and the monitoring of that stuff there's all kinds of that going on in the state of west virginia that was done by the dhhr now the department of Human services, that may be health services on this one. Uh, I forget which one it went to, but it's in there. And it doesn't make sense until you start thinking of it uh, from, from the health. A lot of the nuclear stuff is done is health-based. And so it comes into being able to manage that aspect of it. Does it also uh, be used to promote more pocket uh, nuclear generators? 
the smaller generator plants that we're finding that will be a localized use? Uh, the, the, it could have the potential for that. Uh, as it is set up right now, it's not. West Virginia is definitely in the running for micro, uh, small modular rock reactors. What, what I call pocket, the same thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, there is a lot of interest in doing that. One of the best ones that we've got right now, though, is Omnis of Technologies, and they took over the Pleasance, Pleasance Power Plant, and they are actually taking coal and turning it into hydrogen. They can do it with natural gas as well. And then one of the byproducts of it, and they use the hydrogen to make electricity, and they're making electricity right now. One of the byproducts of it is, though, is graphite. And uh, they can take old cold slurry ponds, burn that off, strip the hydrogen off of it, have the graphite left over, and the rare earths. It is a technology that's going to be a game changer. It's a disruptor in the industry of the graphite and for producing electricity, specifically through hydrogen, clean energy. But it also is not a disruptor when it comes to the mining industry, whether it be natural gas, whether it be coal. And it also has the ability to go back and clean up this fly ash and the cold slurries that are out there. Uh, Craig, I'm well familiar with rare earths and how they're utilized. Graphite, though, I'm less familiar with. What would the, how is uh, graphite being used? Well, graphite is one of the number one components of, for making batteries. Uh, then you're, it's the steel of the future, to be quite honest with you. You've heard of graphene. Graphene is a derivative of graphite also. But graphite, uh, when you hear carbon fiber, that is graphite and how they put it together. So. Okay. All right, next on your list. Well, let's talk about uh, ones that failed. Uh, of the, out of the 43 bills, 37 of them passed. I'll say, by the way, that all 43 of them on the Senate side passed and uh, with virtually no vote, no votes at all dealing with those. Of uh, One of them that um, was interesting, it was a House Bill 2000, or 217. It made it so that, you know, everybody down there is doing their rotunda. And all the murals up in there, you've heard the baby dogs in one mm -hmm. of them and all that. Big controversy. Uh, well, they're finishing that up. And I really don't know where this came from. Uh, but it was like, well, I don't care. That, so they're trying to make it so that the Capitol looks like the way Cass Gilbert intended it when they built it. But remember, the Capitol was built during the Depression. So a lot of it was not finished out. Well, there's four alcoves that are down there at the main well. And Cass Gilbert intended to have George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Lincoln, and Borman, the first governor of the state, to be in those alcoves. So that was a $300,000 appropriation to create the four statues that go into there. But I'm pretty certain on the House side uh, that they ran into trouble because, remember, Byrd, of is taking up one of those alcoves and so i don't know exactly what was going on on that uh i found it a little bit humorous of uh, that that was uh we were trying to do what was intended to be done there but then also you know the real concern was and maybe somebody should have thought this out is what are you going to do with the bird statue and i think that that's why it failed that nobody's actually identified where that would go. I thought it was going to go to D.C. No, no, that's another. That's uh, another statue, bird statue, and okay. that's the Woody of uh, Harrison. Not Woody. Uh, yeah, Harrison. no, you're exactly right. Woody yeah. Williams. Woody Williams. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. And uh, he's that one. I do believe passed. I know it did. And uh, that's a resolution, and that that's a swap out for another statue that's down yeah. there. That, and I forget who was yeah, there. Okay. And so, well, by the way, I got to meet him. He was an amazing yeah. individual to talk to. And you know, uh, if I can, I, I've only known a few Medal of Honor winners, but he was typical of the ones I met. Did a phenomenal thing, well-deserving, and was also very quietly spoken, never promoted himself. He was always looking to the other guy. Yes, yeah. a patriot. Patriot in true sense, you're yes. exactly right. And uh, 
to, 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 when you're sitting there talking yeah. about it, I've got goosebumps yeah. going over um, my yeah. face and my head yeah. and everything because it was all inspiring to sit there and talk to him. And it was like talking to a normal person. Yeah. And you knew his accomplishments, but he was always looking at how he could fix something or improve something. Yeah, and never talked something. about his own accomplishments. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, so, a, it, it's a blessing yeah, to, really to have is, people yeah. like that yeah. and to have the exposure to him. Yeah. Going back to the this one, so we have four – uh, four alcoves. What's where does it stand now? Who are going to be the four individuals, or is it still? So, a, a, in it's flux? in limbo. That bill did not make it. So it's still in flux, line. right? Okay. And uh, so that they'll probably deal with it in the regular session, or maybe not. There was two more of them that um, the treasurer's office, uh, both the outgoing and probably the incoming treasurer, wanted to get done. Uh, and that was Senate Bill 2042 and 2043. And what it did was transfer the powers and duties of the Municipal Bond Commission from the governor's office over to the treasurer's office and it related to the bond indebtedness to, uh, also for 2043. Now, what was happening there? And d d people got concerned that we were trying to take away of uh, powers of the governor. And it really, really wasn't that. Of uh, what was taking place there was that back in the A. James Mansion era in 1992, uh, those because uh, way back in time when the state almost went bankrupt because of some of the investment strategies that uh, the treasurer at that point in time was doing, and then. They, st they stripped away some of the powers at that office and moved it over into the governor's office. It also had another part of the equation, too, and that was that Governor Gaston Caperton's wife was actually running for treasurer, and they were concerned that she would win. Mm -hmm. So that gave an even more desire to remove those powers from there over to the governor's office. But in reality, in most other states— these powers are not in the governor's office, and the governor's office doesn't have all the staff that we all imagined it being there. It would have fit better into the treasurer's office, and then there's somebody retiring down there, that, and that employee would have made it so that before they retired that you could have done this transition and helped get this information and have it solidified in place. That's what was driving it. That's why it passed out of the Senate. And we even moved the effective dates out to July the 1st on 2025 so that everybody knew it was happening, but the work could start taking place on what was taking place. Those two bills failed. Uh, now, you, you know the rationale on the House side, why that one failed? Uh, the, the, I think that the people were concerned about that, that did not understand the bills in their entirety, that this was a, a, a so, loss of powers okay. for, okay. for the upcoming governor. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I have a pretty intimate relationship with the governor's office and working back and forth. And you can walk down through <coughs> um, the tunnels, what they call it. And that's where all the offices are. And I have more staff working for me than what the governor's office does on on a lot of things. Uh, is most of his staff going with him to Washington if he wins the Senate race? No, some are going into the private sector. Some of them are going to hang around, and some of them are, are going to go with the governor. Uh, I know Brian Abraham, the governor's chief of staff, is going to go with the governor down there. And uh, Brian's going to be sorely missed. I hear good things about him. I did, yes. Him and I worked well together, and I'll, I'll include the speaker. We had meetings two and three times a week, and we'd sit down and hammer out things. And same way for economic development. Somebody's thinking about locating in the state. Uh, they'd, be in, they'd come visit me. And I realized, that, wait a minute, this meeting would be better if the governor's chief of staff and the speaker. So I'd sit there and text them. I'd say, hey, you need to get over to my office. In five minutes, we'd all be sitting there. Same thing would happen in the speaker's office or downstairs with the governor. By being there all the time, we moved it to speed of business, not to speed of government, and it showed. It made it so it was a lot easier to develop the economic development. Was the governor involved in these talks as well? At times. 
at times. But you know, keep in mind that the governor's got a lot of duties to do going throughout the state and managing things. So he's not always there. Abraham is the conduit to the governor in his place, that's what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's at times you can make the argument that uh, my chief counsel is the conduit for me as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only do so much in a day, so you prioritize what's going on to be able to make it so that you're efficient in what's happening. And I tried never to let anything wait. If somebody was sitting in my office that didn't even have an appointment, unless I was backed up against the wall, come on back. Let's get it done. Let's hear what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's how Fairmont State, the middle of college, got started. Uh, that, that was a big deal there. Now, another thing that we did was we transferred over $87 million of unappropriate general revenue surplus into PEIA. And that went into the trust fund. That was a statutory uh, obligation to do. Is that to keep the 80-20 ratio? Yeah, I, I wish that. No, it wasn't to keep the ratio. It was to keep the trust fund uh, where it needed to be. And uh, it will make it so that they came out a couple days before we did that over the, the PIA board and announced that they were going to make these huge increases. And it was because of that even though they knew that we were getting ready to do this. And so they got everybody wound up. Somebody needs to go over there and teach them how to have an understanding of what the, you have two realities, the perceived reality and then reality itself. And they need to start operating a little bit in the area of perceived reality. Mm -hmm. Craig, does this mean that every so often the state's going to have to give another infusion of money to PEA? Well, to, first of all, Dave, we had already, to, to, uh, earlier this year, uh, FASA was in trouble, and there was $83 million sitting over there in limbo that was not in the trust fund, and we sweeped that and took that off the table and used that for a FAFSA at that time. And that was a problem that was created by the federal government for that matter. And we're working on things to diminish that in this upcoming year because that hasn't fixed. And that's all got to do with higher ed and the people that are going to, the, uh, the students that are going to that institution. Got 30 seconds left, Craig. But anyhow, this bill made it so that we put the money into the trust fund and they had an additional four million dollars in it. thanks i appreciate it very much it's an absolute pleasure gentlemen you got through a lot there <laughs> yeah we did i'm a little bit hoarse from it good job senate president craig blair